Our first guest tonight is new to the program. He has an extraordinary mind. He has developed that mind by researching many of the things we spend so much time on here and have for 24 years next month in June. Hard to believe, but it's true. Herb Dorsey, Herbert Dorsey, D-O-R-S-E-Y, is standing by from his home in Hawaii. Hopefully he's sitting, not standing. Are you there, Herbert? Yes, I am. Thank you for being here. Tell us a little bit about yourself. I know we talked on the phone briefly, but uh, your name is not a household name, although after tonight we're going to make that change a little bit. Tell us about yourself, Herbert. Well, um, I have a degree in electrical engineering, <clears throat> and it's kind of funny because I went to junior college back in the... I graduated from junior college in 1967, uh-huh. and I was out of school for quite a while before I went back in 1979 to do my upper division work. I was working at jobs and things. Sure. So I was out of school for a while, and I had... Uh, just before I went back to... Um, University of California to do upper division work. I happened to be traveling on the East Coast, and I stopped in at Virginia Beach, um, oh, yeah. where the Edgar Casey Library is, uh-huh. the ARE, Edgar Casey Library. Association of book. Research and Enlightenment. That must have been quite a destination stop for you. I, I know I Yes, I, there. I knew a lot about it, and uh, when I was in there, um, I brought an interesting book. It was by an author that was using a a false name, uh, Rho Sigma. (laughs) And Rho Sigma wrote a book, uh, it was called Ether Technology. And um, a subtitle, A Rational Approach to Gravity Control. So I figured, well, that looks interesting. I think I'll buy it. So I did, and I studied it. And inside I found out all about Thomas Townsend Brown, who had invented... uh, uh, a way to uh, electrically uh, create artificial gravity. And he patented his um, inventions, they're called gravitators, and so he does have patents on them. And this was all done in the 1920s. And I said, my God, this stuff should be <laughs> taught in all the science classes and at the university. Indeed. And then later I went to the university and I realized, hey, they're not even talking about this stuff. They're still teaching us that Einstein said there's no connection between electricity and gravity. And I knew damn well that that wasn't true. Uh-huh. <laughs> and so I began to realize, you know, there's a lot of holes in what they're teaching us in the curriculum at the uh, university. Uh, and in class one time, uh, I was told by one professor uh, that longitudinal electromagnetic waves are an imp- mathematically proven to be impossible. And at that statement, I raised my hand, and the teacher pointed towards me, and I said, well, you know, Nikola Tesla was using uh, spherical antennas to trans- you know, transmit electrical power wirelessly. Uh-huh. Uh-huh. And um, those kind of antennas can only transmit longitudinal waves. <laughs> and he got a real disgusted look on his face and waved at, waved at me, and he kind of waved me aside and said, I don't want to discuss like a Tesla. <laughs> really? <laughs> oh, so what, a, what, an, what an enlightened man he is. What, what campus well, were you uh, at, uh, Herbert? Which campus? This was uh, University of California at Santa Barbara. Oh, my God. That's and where so I went, I, Herbert. That's where I oh, went. Oh, no kidding. Oh, cool. So you, you probably are familiar with the area. Then. Oh, I, I lived there nine years on Del Playa on the ocean, uh-huh. on the beach. Well, this was like a, a, a big awakening to me. I, I thought that universities were supposed to be the place for the free interchange of ideas. Absolutely. And then I realized that, no, they're, they're there to uh, promote programs that uh, corporations decide upon the, the programs they're going to um, teach there, and they're not going to have much leeway in those programs. And that's when I became kind of disillusioned with the Did university. You, uh, Herbert, I, I have, this is fascinating. I have a question. Did you sense at that time that this was a conspiracy of foreknowledge or a conspiracy of kind of multiple ignorance issues that were involved? At the time, I just thought that they uh, 
were trying to push through the, their particular programs, and they didn't want to look outside the the areas that they were uh, teaching us. Right. I didn't really think about a conspiracy at that time. Okay. But but I did later. Um, I graduated in 1982 from UCSB, and, and so at that time I, I decided I was going to become a free energy researcher. That sort of uh, fascinated me, the whole subject. And um, I studied a lot of books by a lot of different authors. One of my favorite sources of info at that time was an outfit known as Rex Research. They had all kind of folios. I, I remember them. I, I remember. Yeah. yeah. And and I studied all the stuff over, and I said, my God, you know, there's so much stuff they don't tell us about in, in college at all. You know, there's just big holes in, the, in their, their course material. And and then later in 1993, I went to a international Tesla symposium that was held in Colorado Springs, and I got to see my first working free energy machine. It was by a fellow named uh, Jonathan Newman, or Joseph Newman, and he called it his energy machine. And there was a lot of engineers uh, present at this um, demonstration, and he invited us to come up and check out the circuit, the wiring and everything, which we did. We had our meters, voltmeters, to check. Uh, it, it did work on batteries. It had batteries supplying energy to it, but the interesting thing is that the batteries were, he, he said, at 500 volts, these are a bunch of, double A batteries all connected in series, so there's a lot of them. He said, at 500 volts, they're discharged, and I'm gonna run this thing for a half an hour, which he did, and it was pumping water. He had it attached to a water pump. So it was pumping water for a half an hour, and we went back and uh, checked the battery voltage after half an hour, and the voltage had gone up to 700 volts. Oh. So it was doing, yeah. <laughs> it was doing work and, and, and charging the battery at the same time. Mm-hmm. Now, one really strange thing is these were Rayovac batteries, which are not supposed to be rechargeable. <laughs> Correct. So that was one thing he pointed out, and he wanted to get a hold of the Rayovac company and try to make, make a deal with them. <clears throat> I don't think that ever panned out. But anyway, um, <laughs> he informed us that um, he was had to sue the patent office for 10 years before he could actually get a patent on his machine. They kept turning it down, even though... He had um, engineers test it, independent uh-huh. testing done that proved that it worked as he claimed. You know, they, they just used every excuse to avoid giving him a patent. So he sued him, and after 10 years, <laughs> ten most people years. go bankrupt in that time. He, he finally won, he, and he got a patent on his energy machine. He actually, that's, that's, he actually had to prosecute that case for 10 years to get a patent. 10 years, that's right. Incredible. So then um, I began to realize, hey, there's some kind of a, a, a force out there that is trying to suppress this stuff. And then I began to start suspecting a conspiracy. But uh, I really became convinced uh, in Ventura, California, in, uh, around 1985. There was a fellow that moved there. His name was um, Dennis Lee. He was the CEO of a um, heat pump factory up in Seattle. And during the time that Carter was president, Carter had a, um, a tax um, credit uh, for anybody that would come up with a, a more efficient energy machine. Uh-huh. So he was making heat pumps, and he told his engineers, hey, let's try to make a better one here and uh, qualify for this tax credit. So they, they started out with a, a heat pump that would probably pump about four times as much heat energy as electrical energy that it took to run the compressors. And they called that a COP of four, a coefficient of performance of four. So his engineers went to work on this, and within about a year they had come up with one that had a COP of 12, which is three times greater than the best ones around. So he qualified for the energy tax relief and got it and started manufacturing these super efficient heat pumps. Uh And they were selling like hotcakes up in Seattle. But the energy companies, they liked heat pumps because they would save electricity, but his heat pumps were saving too much electricity. And so the utility companies got together with the Attorney General of the state of Washington, and they sued him. They sued his company. And he he had to shut his whole company down. He decided he'd move to Ventura, where he thought things would be better. (laughs) Okay.
Okay, so a little anyway, did he know, yeah. Mm-hmm. Yeah, and so he got down there to Ventura, which is my stomping grounds, and um, and in the meantime, uh, he asked his engineers. He said, "Look, if we can get twelve times as much heat pumped as electrical energy that goes into it, um, couldn't we uh, feed that heat into a heat engine, like a steam engine or some other kind oh, of heat sure. engine?" Yeah, and uh, tie it to an electrical generator and get more electricity out than we started with. And his engineer said, "Well, there's this problem of the Carnot efficiency, and mm, tried to give all these reasons why it probably wouldn't work." But one engineer said, "Wait a minute! I know the Carnot efficiency is only about thirty percent in a heat engine, but..." If we use a new one that's been invented by a guy named Fisher, who's down in Australia, if, uh, he claims that his heat engine is 90% efficient. It uses a totally different cycle. And so they got together with Fisher, and they they um, joined uh, their inventive sources and came out with a, um, their super-efficient heat pump tied to a Fisher cycle heat engine, and sure enough, they were getting three times more electricity out of the thing than they were putting into it. Wow. Which is okay. And at the same time, yeah. um, it was cooling the air down. So you would take the heat energy out of the air and turn it into electricity. And so uh, he gave a demonstration in Oxnard, California, in a big auditorium down there. Mm-hmm. I believe it was in 1985. It could have been six. I'm not exactly sure of the date. But it made the newspapers. Uh, members of the press were there. Uh, a lot of engineers were there. He, showed, he added all, his whole machine up on a stage, and he had this bank of 10 uh, rows by 10 in a column of 100 watt light bulbs and he said this load represents 10 kilowatts Mm -hmm. he said I'm going to start the machine up using the electrical power of the um, auditorium he had an extension cord he plugged into it he said after it gets going I can pull the plug and the machine will still keep going it's making its own electricity now and he invited engineers and different people to go up and check the wiring make sure there was no hidden wires or anything they did and then he started up the machine and it started going and then he pulled the plug and threw it off to the side and the machine was still going and then he said now I'm going to turn on the I'm going to apply the load and when he, he threw this big switch and 10 kilowatts worth of light bulbs all lit up and everybody was kind of awed by this and then he said now this is not free energy he said what we're doing is we're extracting the heat energy out of the air around us. And so we're generating 10 kilowatts of electricity here. And at the same time, we're cooling the, the whole auditorium down. So what we have here is a, a free energy machine plus an air conditioning. Air conditioning. Unit. Amazing. <laughs> That's, this is right. a stunning night uh, for you. This uh, Wow. Oh, so anyway, what happened within two days after he gave that demonstration, the Ventura County Sheriff's Department had a big semi-truck and trailer. They backed it up to his laboratories. They arrested Dennis Lee. They confiscated all of the equipment out of his laboratory. Plus, he had a lot of uh, engineers and physicists working there, and they confiscated all the proprietary research papers they had on all his business contracts. They, uh, they confiscated the whole thing, and they put Dennis Lee in jail for a year. He went for a year without any trial at all. His company went bankrupt, and then after it went bankrupt, they released him and dropped all the charges. Oh, but it can't possibly be, Herbert. This That's life, exactly liberty, life, liberty, and the pursuit of happiness, isn't that what this country is all about? How could they yeah, jail a genius like that? that are... <laughs> Listen, that, that decision obviously came down from a very dark and high location. Uh, exactly. This, this is exactly. uh, the lesson there. And Dennis Lee may have been lucky. There are, as you know, a lot of people who are dead because of their genius. Right. Well, he, he finally, after he got out of jail, he sued the Ventura County Sheriff's Department to get all his confiscated property back. Oh. And they told him, no, we're keeping it for evidence. He never got any of it back. Wow. <laughs> so that's the story of Dennis Lee. Well, Dennis got um, his life back. I mean, they look, they could have hung well, him in his he, jail cell. he kept trying. He, yeah. he tried other ventures, but none of them got off the ground after that. Well, this is a... But, this you is know, a, I'm just... A, I, uh, yeah, go ahead. 
There's, I can tell you a dozen similar stories that I found out about after I started re- uh, researching the business. Uh, another famous guy was uh, Edwin Gray, who came out with. The, uh, he started up a company called Ev Gray Motor Company. Uh-huh. He developed a, an electric car that could go 700 miles on a charge in just two uh, standard car 12 volt car batteries. Two batteries, 700 miles. He, he had a 700 mile range with just two 12 volt lead acid batteries. And he actually won an award from Reagan when Reagan was governor of California. He got um, a certificate of merit from the governor. Yeah, but he represented a mortal threat to the automobile industry and the petroleum industry and all the exactly. uh, accessory industries that feed those two. Uh, you can't do that, folks. And this is what happens. You ask, yeah. is there such a thing as what we call free energy, more efficient energy? Are there other means and modalities of gaining it, like pulling energy from the heat around us? Absolutely. Right. There's probably right. a warehouse full of concepts and ideas, a small warehouse at least. And again, so, I point know, out that the, a lot of these people right. end up dead, Herbert. And I'm, I'm glad that Dennis at least survived. Uh, what happened to Edwin Gray, uh, his motor company was, there was a lot of excitement about it, and a lot of investors were lining up to invest in it. Oh, sure. And suddenly he had a big lawsuit against the corporation by the Securities and Exchange Commission, and it shut down the whole operation. <laughs> you know, so, this, I mean, uh, uh, Herbert, this goes all the way back. I mean, w- it goes way back, but I mean, one of the most uh, early examples of this kind of government destruction was what happened to Royal Raymond Reif. That's right. As you That's well right. know. I'm very familiar with Yes, with yes. That. Uh, but uh, I, I kind of like to uh, cover, this is uh, basically covered in my third book, but I'd like to go back to my first book. <laughs> yes, yes. Now, you have a number of books out. There's uh, Herbert Dorsey and there's Herbert G. Dorsey uh, on Amazon. Uh, are we all the same Herbert here, or is there another Herbert Dorsey? Well, I am Herbert Grove Dorsey the Third for my right. total. Well, official that's you. Title. All right, we have coefficients of linear expansion at low okay, temperatures, now, the secret space okay, program, now, and then we fast forward from that, and you've updated I the secret it. space program. Go ahead. Yeah, uh, I have to tell you that you know I gave you a link that goes to an uh, Amazon site showing all my books, but. Unfortunately, they also show my grandfather's books and my father's books, some of his books. My grandfather, he was a Ph.D. in physics, and he taught at the National Bureau of Standards. He was a professor there, oh. and plus he invented quite a bit of stuff himself. My father was an Antarctic explorer. He went went to Antarctica with uh, an Admiral Byrd's um, Second expedition in 1939. Oh, this is fascinating. That now, 1939. That's the same time the Germans went down there in 1938-39. Yep. yep, that's right. We just did a program on that recently here. For a friend yeah, of mine is going it. down there. Uh, yeah. Yeah. Okay, so what I'd like to do is pr- briefly go over my first book, which, or actually my second book, which is um, the Secret History of the New World Order. Right, because there's a lot, number of important points that I would like to point out. Um, I start out with the history of Christianity, which kind of turned off some people. You know, <laughs> they didn't want to know all about how Christianity evolved. But I, I showed how um, much it was changed from the original teachings of Christ to what later became the Catholic Church. Uh, and, how did you ever, then, Herbert, excuse me, this is a wonderful topic. We could spend a whole program on this. How did you oh, find yeah. the research avenues to pursue to come up with data to construct a book to explain this? Because it's it's one of the great cover-ups in history. Well, I, I listed a lot of the sources in my bibliography in the back of the book. All right. uh, I, I do read a lot. <laughs> yeah, to well, you told that. me that when we talked, and obviously you are mm-hmm. a machine. You read all the time. Fascinating. Yep. And uh, that's how, that's I can how do you learn. Two or three books a day. I mean, two or three books You told a week, me I mean. that. You told me that. You're two or three books a week, and you just, you've got a thirst. Have you always felt this way about knowledge and, and seeking it? Well, I'm a Gemini, which has a great deal of, of um, curiosity. Uh-huh. And if anybody has a secret, I'm really curious to find out what the hell they keep in secret and why. <laughs> you know? What so a brilliant way secret, to go about life. That's fascinating. 